Welcome back. Today we're discussing the best diet to prevent atrial fibrillation. Now, if you've had an ablation for atrial fibrillation or a flutter or SVT, um, it's important that you create the conditions in your body to minimize the chance that you have a recurrence of the arrhythmia or that you have um, another arrhythmia that develops in the future. And that's why we're talking about this. So first I'd like to revisit potassium, which we talked about in the previous video. Uh, the apparent AFib prevention sweet spot for serum potassium is 4 millimoles per liter. We arrived at that conclusion based on this data, which showed us that if you had a really low potassium, you had a really elevated increased risk of uh, developing AFib. And also, if you had a high level of potassium, you also seem to have maybe a higher risk of AFib there too. So you don't want to be at either end of the spectrum. You want to be in the middle, which is about 4 millimoles per liter. Uh, so what causes high potassium? So there are medical conditions, but uh, I just plucked out these two things as examples. So certain medications and also impaired kidney function. It's usually not impaired kidney function by itself, although it could be, but it's usually that combined with a high potassium diet and the use of potassium-based salt substitutes. So it's important to talk to your doctor before you do anything trying to screw around with your potassium levels, but uh, what causes low potassium? So that's usually a combination of two things, uh, at least two things. So the first being inadequate potassium intake and the second being excessive fluid loss. So that could be uh, heavy sweating, uh, excessive urination, which is usually caused by something like diuretic use. Uh, that'd be like hydrochlorothiazide, furosemide, chlorothalidone, bumetanide, for example. Um, laxative abuse, so that would cause potentially profuse diarrhea, which is a type of fluid loss, and also severe nausea and vomiting. So fluid loss, fluid loss, fluid loss, fluid loss. Uh, when you lose fluids, you lose electrolytes. So if you already have a low intake of potassium and then you're losing more potassium because you're losing a bunch of fluids, then you're set up for a low potassium level that could be dangerous. Um, so like I said, the, the sort of the first condition that you have to meet is inadequate potassium intake. So are we getting enough potassium in America? And if so, how much is enough? Well, it turns out we're not getting enough. Women are about 10% short of the goal, and so are men. Um, so men and women in America not getting enough potassium. Uh, so if you look at that equation again, what causes low potassium? Inadequate potassium intake combined with one of the, these other things. Um, so most Americans are already predisposed because we, we already have this inadequate potassium intake. Uh, so the normal range versus the sweet spot. Remember, the sweet spot's four. The normal range is 3.5 to 5. So if you're someone with an inadequate intake, there's a reasonably decent chance that you're going to be on the lower end of normal. So you may be closer to the 3.5 millimoles per liter. And in that case, uh, you'd want to push yourself up closer to four. Um, so there's a quote here from the Harvard Public Health website. It is rare for potassium deficiency to be caused by too low a food intake alone because it is found in so many foods. Another reason is a deficiency of magnesium, as the kidneys need magnesium to help reabsorb potassium and maintain normal levels in cells. So it's not just necessarily an issue with potassium, it's also magnesium. And we've talked about magnesium before, and um, if you'll remember before when we talked about it, we found a paper that said approximately 50% of Americans consume less than the estimated average requirement for magnesium. So Americans are not getting enough magnesium and they're not getting enough potassium. And if they're not getting enough potassium, their potassium could be low. If they're not getting enough magnesium, their potassium could also be low. Um, so how do we fix these problems? Is there a drug? Well, as Hippocrates is credited for saying, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. <clears throat> or, as you might expect a pharmacist to say, uh, this is from the European Journal of Pharmacology, let thy food be thy medicine when possible. In other words, there are times when pharmacology 
has a role, uh, pharmaceutical products are needed at different points in time. But um, always try to take care of yourself to the best of your ability uh, all the time. And that includes eating right. So which foods are rich in magnesium? Let's try to be kind of big picture about this. All right, so look at this list of foods that are magnesium rich. Pumpkin seeds, chia seeds, almonds, spinach, cashews, peanuts, uh, shredded wheat, soy milk, black beans, edamame, peanut butter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when I look at this list, I see plant-based foods. With the exception of yogurt, everything on this list is plant-based. So plants are the richest sources of magnesium. Well, what about potassium? Uh, apricots, lentils, prunes, squash, raisins, potatoes, uh, kidney beans, orange juice, soybeans, banana, milk, and spinach. Once again, with the exception of milk, everything on this list is a plant-based food. So plants are the richest dietary source of potassium as well. So I have a theory. Adopt a plant-based diet and reduce AFib risk. Now, I'm not the only one who's thinking this way. Uh, this is a paper published in 2019. Um, the title, Atrial Fibrillation Risk Factor Management with a Plant-Based Diet. Uh, here's a quote from the paper. More recently, risk factor management has gained significant momentum targeting underlying predisposing conditions that are associated with the development and progression of AFib seems prudent. That's kind of why this channel exists, by the way. They go on to say, in this context, nutritional approaches are of paramount importance. So what are these underlying predisposing conditions that are associated with the development and progression of AFib? Uh, so the first one is high blood pressure or hypertension. That's a very strong risk factor for um, atrial fibrillation. And plant-based diets have been proven time and time again to reduce blood pressure. So that's a big thing. Uh, next is blood sugar. Blood sugar we see popping up again and again as being high blood sugar equals high risk of AFib. So plant-based diet, what does it do? It reduces insulin resistance and improves glycemic control in people with diabetes. We know that. So um, that can actually allow people with type 2 diabetes to reduce the amount of medications they use and in some cases eliminate the medications altogether. Uh, so some people with type 2 diabetes on a plant-based diet have been able to reverse their disease. Also, overweightness, obesity, um, these are commonly associated with AFib and those on a plant-based diet get uh, often get some weight loss, um, and that reduces not only the risk of obesity, obviously, but also reduces the risk of obstructive sleep apnea, which is very strongly linked to AFib. Uh, also, inflammation. We see inflammation popping up again and again and again. Inflammation leads, seems to lead to AFib somehow. We're not quite sure how, but there's clearly an association. And plant-based diets... Uh, reduce mediators of inflammatory response. What does that mean? Uh, basically, plants have an anti-inflammatory effect. Um, so like blueberries, very potent anti-inflammatory. Uh, all berries, as a matter of fact. But you know, that's just one example. All kinds of plant-based foods are associated with a strong anti-inflammatory effect. Um, then we have coronary artery disease. So basically, is the heart healthy? Um, if your heart's not healthy, then you're at an increased risk of developing AFib. And plant-based diets have been shown to prevent and even reverse atherosclerosis and uh, coronary artery, artery disease. So, so that's kind of a big deal. Um, so this quote from the paper, it is now widely accepted that a high cardiovascular risk profile, which is closely related to a sedentary Western lifestyle, is detrimental and requires sustainable management. Now, when they say detrimental, keep in mind, they're talking about AFib. This whole paper is about atrial fibrillation. So what do they mean by sedentary Western lifestyle? Um, well, when they say Western lifestyle, I immediately just think about the food. Um, that's probably what they're referring to. So 
we tend to, I mean, we're Western, the Western world is relatively affluent. And as a consequence, we tend to have a lot of meat in our diet because meat tends to be more expensive. And when you eat a lot of meat, you're basically displacing plants. So if you, if you eat a lot of meat, you're not eating a lot of fruits and vegetables and nuts and beans, etc. So the consequences of that are uh, diseases of affluence like um, diabetes, obesity, uh, different inflammatory conditions, etc. Uh, so the set, when they say sedentary, um, that kind of refers to our dependence on cars. We don't walk around a lot. We don't have a lot of physical activity. Day to day, we tend to watch a lot of TV and ride around in our cars. And for most of us, probably sit at a desk behind a computer during the workday. Um, so that's kind of what they mean by the sedentary Western lifestyle. So to combat that, um, basically two things. You want to be physically active as much as possible. And then you also want to improve your diet and steer it more toward a plant-based diet. Uh, so what is meant by plant-based? Basically, there's five, what is that, six. Six big things you should be looking at. Um, you want to consume whole grains, legumes, which would be like beans and peanuts, uh, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds. And also, you want to exclude uh, most or all animal products. So we're talking things like red meat, poultry, um, dairy products, and eggs. Uh, diets based on whole plant foods not only maximize protective foods, but also exclude potentially harmful animal foods that are high in saturated fat. So what do, what do they mean by that, protect, maximize protective foods? Um, well, plants tend to be high in phytonutrients, antioxidants, anti-inflammatory effects, um, potassium, magnesium, all the good stuff is in the plants. Meanwhile, a lot of animal foods, you're getting a lot of saturated fat. Saturated fat triggers inflammation. Also, meat does not have any fiber, uh, whereas plants are very rich in fiber. And that's another big thing because fiber itself has a big anti-inflammatory effect. The high magnesium content of a whole food plant-based diet is also noteworthy because low serum magnesium is moderately associated with the development of AFib in individuals without cardiovascular disease. Um, not to mention that basically the majority of Americans are not getting enough magnesium in their diet. And the reason for that is because they're not eating enough plants. Uh, people are eating too much meat and not only just meat, it's really just low, nutri low nutrient dense food. Uh, junk food, French fries, things that just don't, they don't have a lot of um, nutritional value. Current literature points at strong evidence for the beneficial effects of plant-based diets and cardiovascular disease and its risk factors. Physicians halted and reversed coronary artery disease and even heart failure in severely impaired individuals by prescribing a plant-based diet. Why would this not be possible in patients suffering from atrial fibrillation. Uh, so that's kind of the concluding statement that I pulled from the paper. And um, I think we've pretty much shown uh, why it's reasonable to think that way. Uh, so that's pretty much it for this presentation. Uh, next, we'll be talking about alcohol because it is plant-based, right? For instance, beer is made from hops. Wine is made from grapes. Are they not healthy? Um, and surely you've heard people tout the cardiovascular benefits of wine. Um, is there anything to that? And I just want to be upfront with you and say, well, there may be something to that, uh, but there also may be drawbacks. And what we're worried about here is the impact on atrial fibrillation risk. So we'll be talking about that in the next video. So thank you for tuning in.